All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for Home Garden and Landscape 101. I'm Greg Berry, Assistant Director in the UAB Office of Alumni Affairs. Just a quick disclaimer, since this is a virtual discussion, many of us are coming from our homes. Don't be surprised if you hear and see kids or pets. Just have to throw that out there. Also, in order to be mindful of our guests, I would like to ask everybody to remain muted. Today, we are excited to have Tim Sullivan with us. So we can learn about growing and maintaining our flower garden. Tim is a 1990 graduate of UAB's College of Arts and Sciences. He's a university's former landscape and recycling manager, retiring from his role just a few months ago. Tim is a self-taught horticulturist and traces his passion for gardening to his father and his aunt. Tim, welcome. It is so great to have you here tonight. And we will get to the whole thing here in a second. But first, we want to throw up a, a poll for everybody. And we'll give everybody a few moments to uh, fill this out. We want to know how good of a green thumb you have, or for some of us, perhaps like me, how much of a brown thumb. Uh, how do you rate yourself as a gardener? Please select which of these options best describe your experience. Let's go ahead and leave the poll up for a moment so you can just submit your response while we wait. Just a reminder that the chat function is available and we will make sure to leave time at the end of Tim's presentation to answer your questions. And with that, let's see. And with that, we will go ahead and invite Tim to, uh, to present with us. Tim, so thankful that you're here with us tonight and go ahead, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Greg. You've been great. You've been a, a great help to me through this process. And I wanna thank the, the, the National um, Alumni uh, Association for thinking about me. I'm, I'm very grateful to be here, happy to be here. Uh, I want everyone to know that I took the poll and I checked, I still have a lot to learn. Um, and I think that's what you're gonna learn mostly from gardening is it's a, it's a humbling experience. <laughs> um, but I, I want you to think like a gardener. So at the end of this presentation, I want you to be in tune with nature. Um, do, I, do I want you to um, still think gardening is all about bluebirds and beautiful flowers and beautiful moving streams? I do. I, I don't want to take the emotion away from you. Um, I love gardening. I love being out in the garden, but there's some things that um, I've learned from my 38 years of experience gardening. I want to pass those along to you tonight. Firstly, a garden is the work of a, of a lifetime. It's not the work of a weekend. <laughs> so, and, and that's the mistake that people make. Uh, they rush to the big box store, they buy some shrubbery, they buy some trees, they buy some flowers, it becomes a weekend event, and uh, oftentimes they're unhappy with the result towards the end. So you have to think of your garden as a lifetime work, just not a weekend. As I said, you're gonna have to learn to embrace defeat. You're gonna have to learn from your mistakes. You have to learn to laugh at yourself because at the end of the day, Mother Nature's in charge. And that's what I, the message I want to send, the main message. I want you to be in tune with Mother Nature so that your gardening efforts will be enjoyable for you, okay? Another important concept of, of thinking like a gardener is to do no harm. Um, so there's a great book out there that, that I recently found. It's uh, Dr. Uh, Talman from uh, the University of Delaware. And his book was Nature's Best Hope. And this concept was very interesting that if all of us as homeowners, if we used our yards and thought of it as one big national park, that if we took that approach by doing small things in our yard, we could affect the environment in a positive way. So there's six points that he made in his book. I want to share them with you. The first point that he made was to reduce the size of your lawn. So when I became a homeowner 39 years ago, the first thing I did was reduce the size of my lawn because I'm a lazy man at the end of the day. I don't want to spend my, my Saturdays, I don't want to spend my weekends mowing the lawn. Also, I love shrubbery. I love flowers. So I wanted space for my shrubs and flowers. So I reduced my lawn. And I did that in a fashion that 
will save time for me. I made pools of grass through my yard. I made semicircles. I made trails of grass through my yard so that when I'm mowing, I'm always moving forward and I reduce the time that I have to turn. So I'm on a half acre lot. I reduced my lawn to about 50%, maybe 60%. It takes me about 30 minutes to do my lawn and, and I'm saving time and I feel great about that. So Dr. Talame, he wants you to, to reduce your lawn because lawn's kind of an expensive business. It's kind of a nasty business. It takes a lot of chemicals and fertilizer to have these really lush lawns. And most of us don't need that. It's okay if you do. Uh, I want you to have what you want. Uh, but, you know, my front yard is not the, um, not the pitch at BBVA soccer stadium. Uh, it doesn't really matter if there's a weed or two in there. <laughs> I've got some a nice ground cover, um, but I'm not putting a whole lot of uh, effort in it like uh, Dr. Talame wants me to do. Also, he suggests that you plant an oak tree or a hickory tree if you can. So uh, those are native trees, particularly to this region. Um, they produce acorns and nuts, uh, which will attract wildlife to your yard. He wants you to plant uh, native plants. He wants you to introduce a water feature in your yard and it's helpful if it's bubbling. Um, I've seen some great products out there on the web. Um, they are solar and they'll go in your bird bath with just a little small disc and, and they go in and they'll pump water as long as the sun's shining, they'll move the water to keep it clean and healthy for the animals that it would attract, the birds and, and whatnot. Also, he suggests that you work with your neighbors. Um, maybe that means you don't have to buy a mower, you just borrow your neighbors. I don't think that's what he had in mind, but um, you know, I approached my neighbor a few years ago and said, hey, do you mind, uh, you've got a great space for a vegetable garden there. I, I would love to work that space and share vegetables. And, and he was all in for that idea. And we, we had a great summer and we got to know each other well and we're friends to this day. So. Talk to your neighbors about your yard, what you can do. Maybe you can plant a tree. Maybe your yard's not big enough to plant a tree, but if it's near the property line or just over the property line into your neighbor's yard, that oak tree or that hickory tree could be an asset for you both, but also for Dr. Talamy's notion of everybody's yard being part of a big national park. And his sixth point was to remove invasives. So in our area, um, evasives are Chinese privet, um, kudzu, um, mandinas are very invasive, uh, mahonias are very invasive. You, you see them in the woods and, and they don't belong in an Alabama forest. So anything we can do to remove an evasive is a good idea. Um, so think like a garden, do no harm. Okay, this is what we need to do if we're gonna think like a gardener, we gotta develop a plan. The who, what, where, and when, and how. Notice I, I didn't include why. <laughs> maybe, maybe we don't wanna think about why, uh, particularly when it's 90 degrees. Um, but anyway, let's move on. Who, who is you and the who, who is me and all your gardening friends out there. And that's the nice thing about gardening there's a large network of people out there. There's also a large network of educational resources available to us. So through the extension centers, um, so every university that was a land grant college, Auburn, Alabama A&M, Mississippi State, Georgia, they all have extension services. And those extension services take that agricultural knowledge, all those PhDs that are down there studying soil science, et cetera, they're available to, to you and I. Um, so you can go on to these sites, you can log on, they've got great search engines, you can find specific details about how to grow what you're interested in. So the Extension Service is, is a great gardening friend for us, okay? The what? What are your plant selections? What are your soil amendments going to look like? Okay, plant selection is very, very important. Gardening is the work of a lifetime, not a weekend. Don't rush to the to the garden store and bring home some stuff on the weekend because that stuff's gonna be with you. <laughs> in the case of a tree, the tree will be around for centuries. In the case of a shrub, 
shrubs can live well over 100 years. I mean, I've managed shrubs on UAB campus that are easily 60 years old. So it's marriage. <laughs> Think about it before you, you make your plant selections. So the where. Well, you have to do a site analysis. Um, what's the sun like? What's the drainage like? What's the function of this area? Is it a public area? Is it a private area? Is it a utility area for the garbage cans and whatnot, maybe around the garage? What's going to be the mature plant sizes of, of these plant selections that you bring home? There's a lot to think about with the, with the site analysis, um, and you'll see how that develops later in my presentation about plant size. All right, I'm going to skip the when for now, and, and we're going to jump down to how. how. <laughs> and again, like I said, with who uh, we learn from each other, uh, YouTube, uh, we learn from our good friends at the Extension Service, we learn from our neighbors. Uh, hey, you, you've all uh, logged in today to, to, to see what you, can, what you can learn and what I can learn from you. So at the end of the day, we're going to do what works, okay? We're going to do what works. So let's jump back to the win. So as I mentioned, Mother Nature is in charge. So we all better learn to work with her, okay? So what I did was went and developed a gardener's calendar for you. Uh, to think about. So my calendar starts in February, uh, around Valentine's Day through St. Patrick's Day. And you have to be thinking to yourself, well, okay, why didn't this guy start in January? And today on the way over, I thought to myself, why didn't I start in October? It would have been a better month. Um, but nonetheless, let's start with Valentine's Day and, and think about what those things we need to be doing and what are those things we need to be anticipating, okay? So Valentine's to St. Patrick's Day is a great time to mulch. You can use pine needles. You can use bark of whatever form, chips, shred it. Um, even leaves make good mulch. So the purpose of mulch is to hold moisture in the soil, and you want about two or three inches, and also to block light from getting down to weed seeds, so that would prevent germination. So it doesn't matter what it looks like. It could be leaf mulch, um, but it sure does look nice. Nice fresh mulch uh, really looks pretty. So um, val around Valentine's is a great time to, to start that work. Great time to transplant shrubs and trees. So my yard is kind of like my den um, in other parts of my house. I rearrange the furniture every once in a while. So I've been known to move trees and shrubs and I've been fairly successful at it because I work with nature and I do it in February before the sap starts to rise, before growth comes, before the temperatures increase. I move them and I'm very careful with the way I do it. You know, you need to YouTube a a uh, procedure before you do it, and it's a commitment, uh, but it's a great time, great time to rearrange the yard if you're unhappy with something out there. It's a great time to shear hollies, and I, I use the word hard shear holly. So uh, think of a Christmas tree, a Christmas tree form, and there's hollies that are in Christmas tree form. Well, at the Christmas tree farm, those trees are sheared uh, with power shears. Uh, at farms, they use long, thin, thin knives as well, like really thin machetes and they'll, they'll use them, they'll cut down in this fashion in order to, to form the Christmas tree look. So February is a great time to reduce the size of hollies or improve their form, as I mentioned, the Christmas tree form. So lots of hollies are used as hedges. It's a great time to hedge um, the hedge. <laughs> and. Um, Really, you can you can you can get really deep into that hedge at that time of the year. Um, the temperatures are very favorable. Uh, new growth hasn't started, um, so that's one of the few uses of a shear that I would recommend. Uh, but hard shearing hollies is a great time of year to do it. Prep flower bed. So um, you know if if you already have an existing flower bed, generally in 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 February your uh, flower beds are full of pansies and cabbages and whatnot. 
But if you haven't built your bed yet, if you haven't built your flower bed, if you haven't built your garden site, February is a great time to go out and turn the soil. So I take a shovel and I jump on that shovel with both feet and I get that spade as deep as I can get it in the soil. And I turn the soil. It's a great workout. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great winter workout. Um, but it really pays a dividend. What, what it does is, is takes the organic matter on top, it takes the, whatever topsoil we may have. And in my yard, I have a, I have a clay soil. It's a clay, sandy soil. And I'll take it and I'll turn it. And I'll go ahead and do that prep work for my vegetable gardens and any flower bed I wish to, I wish to um, put in later. Apply pre-emergence. So pre-emergence typically are used in lawns in the homeowner case. They prevent weeds from germinating. So what happens is gardeners, uh, homeowners, people that are excited, people that are full of emotion about their garden, they think about those weeds, oh, about Memorial Day. That's when they're calling me. Um, the weeds have already germinated. Not a whole lot you can do. At that point, you're in a post-emergent situation. That's where you're spraying chemicals on to kill the weeds. My yard, I don't use any pre-emergence. Uh, my backyard is for my dog. That's his yard. Hard time, hard to grow quality lawn with, with dogs. Um, kids, they're tough on, on lawn. So the backyard is, is fairly weedy. Uh, my front yard, um, I have a few weeds and I, I, I pull them early in the year uh, as soon as they germinate. But I'm, I'm very happy with the cover of, of my lawn without pre-emergence. It, it, it works very well for me. And it could work well for you if you follow some simple, simple advice um, in, in order to control those weeds. Uh, February is a great time to evaluate your irrigation plan. So you may have an irrigation system, and if you do, that's fabulous. Uh, great time to get out there and tweak it, um, make adjustments so that you're not wasting water, et cetera. Uh, if you don't have an irrigation system, it's a great time to think about, hey, I need some new hoses. <laughs> I need some new sprinkler heads. I need to go ahead and get my plans ready in, now in February. Because I always want you thinking ahead. I want you 90 days ahead, okay? So um, that's why I wanted to start in, in October uh, with my gardener's calendar, because I want you to go ahead and get the mindset of, okay, here, today is today, and the, my opportunities have lost. I've lost lots of opportunities to do things in the, in the yard today, but 90 days from now is a new day, okay? A great time to get the mower ready. Um, if you're not borrowing one from your neighbor, <laughs> which is the best way to go. Um, and I, I, I had to put in there, please don't commit crepe murder. So um, if you haven't seen it, it's a terrible crime scene. Um, so a lot of it this year for some reason, but um, crepe myrtles bloom on new growth. And so that's why people prune them. Um, but the work of a garden is the work of a lifetime, not the work of a weekend. So people rush off to the, to the big box store and they bring back some, some um, crepe myrtles and the crepe myrtle is going to grow 30, 35 feet. And they put it four feet off their foundation on the corner of their house. And of course, they're unhappy with the result. And that guy's going to live for a very, very long time. So crepe myrtles are a plant that you can get them under five feet and well over 20 feet at, at, at mature um, at maturity. So it's important with your plant selections uh, to make good selections, ones that you're going to be happy with. So back to the crepe myrtle. Um, crepe myrtles bloom on new wood. Okay, so Mother Nature produces that new wood for you, that new growth for you every spring into the summer. Generally, that, generally it's into June and July before they really start to uh, bloom well. Um, so the crepe murder comes in and it cuts large material. If you're going to cut a crepe murder, you only want to cut anything that's pencil diameter and smaller. It, it, we'll use this pen. Anything on there that's pen, pen diameter and smaller, you can cut away. And um, crepe myrtle is a great plant to learn how to prune on. It has a very defined collar, which is where the branch meets the trunk. And it has a little swelling there. It's called the collar. It's, telling you exactly where to prune that guy. So 
what, how I treat my upgrade myrtles, I'm only gonna prune any damaged wood, any broken wood, any diseased wood. I'm gonna prune wood that is growing towards the anterior of the plant, um, branches that may rub, I'm gonna cut those away. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on my crepe myrtles. Um, Mother Nature's gonna, gonna do a great job producing new growth for you and blooms for you. I have helped them along a little bit with a little fertilizer, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but that, uh, that's about all your crepe myrtle really, really needs. And, and I've gone the full gamut in, in my career where early on there was a lot of crepe myrtle going on. And then we spent a lot of time pruning everything, pencil diameter and smaller, um, you know, spending two, three, four hours on one crepe myrtle. Um, it makes a beautiful presentation, <laughs> um, but they'll still bloom equally as well um, without, without, without all that intensive pruning. So, um, that's what I'm thinking about Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, are, are those points. We're going to move on to April Fool's Day, to Tax Day, um, to Easter. Easter, I guess Easter is on a three-week pattern, so it's not always on the same, um, same weekend. So I chose April Fool's and Tax Day as, as, as um, points for us to think about on the calendar. So what's happened in April? We've had our last frost, if we're lucky. Um, throughout the course of my almost 40 year career, um, our last frost was pretty much always tax day, April 15th. Um, now the average last frost is April 1st, April Fool's Day. So it's a two week span of time that it's, that it's changed in, in my career. And, and we don't, we're not really having a hard frost uh, with that as well. So the danger of frost has passed. We're gonna start thinking about, hey, do I need to fertilize or should I not fertilize? And this is the question I want you to ask yourself. Are you happy with the growth and color of that plant? If you're happy with it, don't fertilize it. Mother Nature's taking care of it. If you're unhappy with the growth in the color, let's fertilize it. But there's some simple things we wanna do. We don't wanna do any harm, right? So it's best to do a soil test to find out what nutrients your plants need. And then with fertilizer, the, the primary ingredients that you see, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Those are the three numbers that are represented. Those are the three elements that are represented by numbers on the package. 10, 10, 10. 10% 10 nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% uh, potassium. There's 12 elements that plants need to survive. So those are the three primary. So what you need to understand is you're going to get what you pay for. Uh, if you buy a fertilizer that's a formulation of 10, 10, 10, 13, 13, they're very cheap. Um, they're quick release. Um, they don't have other nutrients available. In the, in the mixture and where you really pay extra money for the better quality is how the, the nitrogen is treated. So I buy a product for my shrubs and trees. The formulation is 12-6-6. The 12% nitrogen is 40% slow release. So I have a 60% quick release to the plant. It gets it the nitrogen that it needs. It helps that first spring flush up growth. And then I have 40% of nitrogen in reserve. And the formulations, they vary. Some are very expensive and the, the chemistry is complex, you know, how they slow, slowly release the nitrogen. Mine's not so complex. It's gonna last about 90 days, maybe 60 days if, if we have a lot of water. So do no harm. Only fertilize if you're unhappy with the color of the size of your plant material, your shrubs and your trees, okay? Flowers and vegetables, it's a little different story and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, but th that's the message for fertilizer. So I'll use that 1266 through the year. And then if I'm, I'm impatient, I'll use a, a quick release like a miracle Grow. 
uh, on a particular shrub or plant or tree uh, to see if I can get a little bounce. So I'll take a, a dual approach to it, but it's very conservative. April's a great time to be thinking about pulling those weeds. If, if, you're, if you're a person that doesn't want to use pre-emergent and your shrubbery bed, and there's, there's formulations for your shrubbery bed as well, just like your lawn. Um, February's a great time to, to pull them while they're young, they're tender, the roots haven't set. If you wait 30, 60, 90 days, those weeds will whip you, okay? Uh, you're not gonna get them up out of the ground. So April's a great time to do that. Um, rains are coming, temperatures are nice, great time to pull, pull weeds, okay? Okay, um, frost, the danger of frost has passed. It's time to start thinking about flowers and vegetables. Uh, hopefully you've turned your bed really well, okay? Um, we'll talk more about flowers and, and vegetables in detail, um, but it's time to start making those selections, okay? So um, do a little homework. Um, Get on the internet, talk to your gardening friends, and um, we'll go from there. Let's move on. Uh, Mother's Day. It, um, so most of your azaleas, primarily your azaleas, are going to bloom in April. So once a plant has stopped blooming, a plant that has bloomed in April or prior, that's the great, best time to prune it because that plant sets its buds for the for the blooms in the current growing season okay so may june july august into september all the way to frost it's setting buds for the next year so people will call and say hey my azalea is they didn't bloom and I, and I go over and it looks like somebody took a shear at the wrong time of the year um, maybe sometime after the fourth of july is um, the cutoff point for me after the fourth of july they've broke out a shear, they cut off all the blooms for their azaleas, and consequently, they had no blooms in the spring. So remember, you wanna do no harm. So if you're gonna do some pruning, uh, the best way to prune is with um, a hand pruner. Um, put those shears away. Um, you wanna prune the dead wood out, you wanna prune the diseased or damaged wood out, and you can do that any time of the year. And really, you can prune any time of the year on a plant, as long as you're doing it selectively and with some moderation, okay? So prune most plants that bloom in April before and before. Most plants that bloom in April and before, prune them after they bloomed, okay? Examples are azaleas, yellow bells, some spireas. Um, do your homework before you break out that shear because typically around Mother's Day, that's when people wanna, wanna start breaking out the shears. Let's move on to the next, next calendar. Um, well, we're still in Mother's Day, it looks like. So again, I, I'm going to expound some more about old wood and, 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 and new wood. You've got to do your homework. Selective pruning, uh, there's a nice photo there of a hand pruner. Selective pruning, picking a part of that plant and selectively pruning it. Oftentimes you reach down below the canopy of the shrub to, to make your selection to prune it. Is a much better way than shearing. So it's important to me that you not go out and create boxes and squares with your shears, okay? Um, I went for a walk today through my neighborhood, saw a lot of boxes and squares. Um, square on each end of the house, three, five boxes in the middle, uh, or balls in the middle. Um, some of them, uh, azaleas, for example, um, sheared, sheared hard, they're not going to bloom in the spring. An azalea is a big mounding plant. We should prune to enhance the characteristics of the plant, not rob them, okay? So boxes and squares is not how your shrubs should look. They should look like they were intended to look. They should have the characteristics they have. If they're a berry producer, if you come out and prune them a long time of the year, you're going to not have any berries come November and December, okay? So you, do a little homework before you break out those shears. Um, have a plan, and um, you know I want you to know a pro when it when it when it comes to pruning. Um, an afternoon with a shear can do a can do a lot of damage, particularly boxwoods, which are very expensive plants, very treasured plants. They live a very long time. Um, they can be set back for years with a shear. So 
Um, no approach. Let's move on. Okay, Memorial Day. You better get ready because some heat's coming, okay? <laughs> this is where you don't want to think about the why. Why in the world am I doing this, for goodness sakes? So let's get our water plan together, okay? Let, but you're going to need it. You're going to need it come June, July, and August. You're going to need it well into October. Um, hopefully, you won't have to use a lot of it. If, if you, I mentioned I wanted to start in October. I love to plant in October and November because I have six months of time before we get to the stresses of summer. So I can put a shrub in in October and it will be growing roots for six months before I get to the, the stresses of summer. So that gives me an edge. And that's what gardening's all about. You want to think like a gardener, you want to get an edge on everything. So Memorial Day, you're in the summer, should you fertilize again? We've gone 60, 90 days since our last fertilization. If you're happy with the color and the growth, don't fertilize it. If you're unhappy with it, let's fertilize it again. Consider a quick release like miracle Grow on it. See if you can get a balance. Um, see what's going on there. You might want to revisit your mulch around Memorial Day. Uh, specific plants may not have enough. You can carry some over. Um, and you better break out your big funny hat because um, it's going to be on. It's, 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 you know, June, July, and August, and September, it's not very romantic out in the garden anymore. Um, it's, it's, it can be a struggle, so uh, prepare yourself. So here we are, the dog days. Now, uh, you, you better be prepared to water. And how much is too much? Um, I, I want an inch of rain every week. I want, I, want, I want an inch of rain every week, so I measure my rain and make sure that I, my plant material is getting at least an inch of rain. If it's not, I'm looking for signs of wilt. So I'm an old-fashioned gardener. I'm going to take a plant to the point of wilt. Um, and I've been watching plant material for a long time. Now I, can, I can tell when it's going to be pre-wilty, <laughs> okay? I can see a little discoloration in it. Um, I know it needs a little extra water. And if it's important to me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over and I'm going to hand water that plant. That's the most effective way to get water to it. Um, I'm, once I've reached runoff, once water's running away from the plant and not soaking in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go water something else. I'm going to come back later and water it again so that I can get some water down in the soil. And I, I heard this throughout my career at UAB. Uh, no, we didn't water because it rained. Well, you know, did you get an inch? <laughs> did it rain for 20 minutes? Did it all just run off? Um, you know, slow beneficial rain is what you want, right? You, know, you want to get some moisture way down in the soil. Weed control in the summer months in your shrubs and beds. Um, you know, if, if you've waited this long and those, those uh, weeds are present, I would just control the seed head. So I have a shear, a hand shear with an extended handle, uh, maybe about 30 inches. Um, that way I can just reach down and I can just clip that seed head out of that plant so that I'm, I'm not, you know, making babies. And okay, the plant, the mother plant's still there, but at least I'm not spreading. So that's the mode I'm in uh, because it's no fun to pull weeds in the summertime. And then as I mentioned, um, you can really prune any time of the year as long as you're doing it lightly, as long as you're not using a shear, as long as you're using a hand pruner and doing selective pruning. Okay, we've made it to the summer months and, and we're into to Labor Day and Halloween. And um, this, is, um, this is a great time to um, continue to water. <laughs> the driest month out of the year is October. Um, so it's not over. And, you know, we, we start losing light in August. You, you, can, you can see the plant material slowing down in its growth, uh, but it's still actively growing well to last frost. Um, so you, you want to make sure that you're getting water to the plants that need them um, because you can still lose them. So in your pre-emergent cycle, the first one will appear in October, you know, as far as where we are right now in the calendar. So, and I'm referring to lawns because most people aren't spending the money to, 
to uh, put pre-emergence in their shrub areas and their flower beds. If you're going to treat your lawn with pre-emergent herbicides or post-emergent herbicides, you better call a pro. Don't know a pro, call a pro. And I want you to interview two or three um, pros. <laughs> and I like to use an owner operator. Um, I find that, you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> I like those guys. They're very dependable. They're very thorough. There's a lot of good ones out there. I can help network you. Um, but again, I don't use pre-emergence in my, in my lawn. There was a time when I did, but I didn't do it very long. Um, I mow often. Uh, I, I'll mow every 10 to 14 days. Therefore, I won't let a weed produce seed. I'll go out in April when the, when the world's nice and wet and it's, and it's warm and I'll sit on the lawn and I'll pull a few patches of weeds. I don't have many patches. Okay. Now that's not true about the backyard. That's where the dog lives. That's his. I have lots of weeds back there. Um, but in the public spaces, I don't have a whole lot of weeds and I enjoy what I think is a decent ground cover. Okay. So, you know, Dr. Talame, he suggests that we eliminate our lawn areas. Well, the lawn surrounds our house because it helps keep the rodents and the snakes and the mammals out of our house. Okay. Um, animals like shelter. They don't want to be out in an exposed area where a, an owl or a, a hawk could get them. So you, you notice he said reduce the size. He didn't say get rid of it. So a lawn's a great happy hunting ground for, for the owls and, and, the, uh, and the hawks. So that, that brings uh, that concept of a national park, a web of national parks with each, each everyone's yard. Um, so that's what he's getting at. Um, and again, I, I don't want to bash them. Uh, the lawn industry at all. If, if, an, if, a lawn, if a beautiful lawn is important, I love it. You know, um, I love an athletic field. I, I, I spent a lot of time on them. Um, and it's necessary to have that intense cultivation if on an athletic field. Um, but maybe not so much in your yard. So you might want to rethink that. Uh, you might want to seriously think about eliminating some lawns so that you've got more free time um, and you've got more uh, garden space. And of course, you know, Labor Day, um, Halloween is pansy season time. Um, pansies are beautiful. They're relatively easy to grow. They need great drainage. Um, you want to build your flower beds up high so you have great drainage. That way you can avoid disease problems. Um, pansies are susceptible to a number of root rot diseases. So you, you want to have great drainage. You're particle size in your soil, you want large particles in that soil. So um, soil is made up of three particle sides, sand, which is the largest, silt, which is the medium grade, and then clay, which is the densest, right? So you can take a ball of clay and squeeze it in your hand and it doesn't crumble, it stays a ball. Um, I have sandy clay in my, in my yard, so I'll put it in my hand when it's wet and crumb, and squeeze it, and then when I open it, it will crumble a little bit, but it, it's, it's sort of has a, 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 still maintains sort of the basic form, but it'll, it'll crumble a little bit. If you don't have that particle size in there, it's gonna stay solid. So with your flower beds, you're gonna introduce larger particle sizes. So you'll go to the store, there's this array of amendments out there. <laughs> Potting soil, garden soil, raised bed soil, soil with, um, amendments for um, fertilizer, amendments for water holding capacity. Um, so take a minute, uh, do a little homework about your soils and the plants that you're trying to match up with. Well, let's see what's going on after Halloween. Oh, Halloween to Christmas. It's a prime time for planting shrubs and trees. Um, it's my favorite time of the year. <laughs> um, I want to get my shrubs and trees in the ground. If I want to add a mosaic, if I want to add a um, hydrangea, and you have to understand my yard is sort of a collection of, um, of plant material, sort of a botanical garden, right? Um, but I have repeating themes, which is an important theme in landscape design. Um, I use uh, texture, 
uh, which is an important thing. Uh, so I, I try to put a little thought behind it. But at the end of the day, it's a collection, right? So uh, that's my passion. I want to be out um, in um, October to Christmas. I want to get my plants in the ground. I've got, that gives me six months of, of time for those roots to establish before the stresses of summer come on. Uh, another thing I'm passionate about, and, and, and you can probably tell from the presentation, is pruning shrubbery. <laughs> so those are my two favorite um, aspects of this business, and it's a wide-ranging business. There's a lot, I mean, biology, chemistry, there's a lot to know. Um, but you've got a lot of good friends out there that can help you along the way. That's the nice thing about it. So um, also a great time to get your soil test. If, you, if you're going to, if you're going to, manage um, your lawn uh, a, a lot intensely, like I mentioned with fertilization and pre-emergence, you better get some soil tests. Um, if you're having problems with your flowers or your vegetables, you might want to get a soil test. Um, soil test is going to tell you about the pH, which is important in our area. You know, we have a lot of oak trees and pine trees. Well, that's an indication that our pHs are 6.5 to 6, maybe maybe 5.5. So you, you're not uh, too acidic, you're not too alkaline. You, you, we're sort of in the middle here. But what happens with fertilization is that years of fertilization will change the soil chemistry. So you, if you're in the fertilization business, if you're, if you're in the lawn business, um, and what I mean by that, if you're managing it intensely at your house, um, good time to get your soil test. Um, lots of information about how to interpret them, and then you make your selections about your fertilizer going forward. Okay, so now it's back to uh, the first of the year. It's, it's uh, New Year's and into Valentine's. So we, we've gone our 12 months. So um, time to plan. As I mentioned, the who, what, where, and when, and how are we gonna accomplish these things we want to accomplish. We don't want it to be the work of a weekend. We want to think it through. Gardening, I mean, spend a lot of money in the, in the yard. So don't get in a hurry. Make your plans. Study your plant selections. There's, I'll plug two books. There's one, um, The Book of List. Um, Chaplin, um, Trish Lois Chaplin is the author. Um, Chaplin, I-N. Um, she produced this book, The Book of List. She's from Homewood. She's produced this book, so you can flip through it. And if you want to know about shrubs that will flower in the shade, you can flip to the sh shrub section. <laughs> and there's a whole list of plants, which is a fabulous re reference. And interestingly, she's, she's dotted the book with people like myself and um, garden owners and landscape architects with quotes that talk about specific types of plant material and what you want to achieve. So th that's a great book to pick up. I uh, already mentioned Dr. Tallamy's book out of Delaware. Um, and then thirdly, uh, a book I'm excited about is um, Wildflowers in Alabama, a Midgley. Um, Jan Midgley is the author. Um, also has a great number of lists in there of native materials. And also um, an interpretation of our forest here in Alabama and the southeast. Um, Know, things you don't think about very often, the, the soil types and the, and the types of plant material that are um, through a region. So it, it's, it's fun stuff to, to think about. Let's see. All righty. I promised we'd talk a little bit about vegetable gardens and flowers, and I threw in lawns as well. So, you know, with a vegetable garden, you've got to have great sun. So full sun is six hours or more per day uh, with a good garden. Uh, you've got to have great drainage. Um, you know, you don't have to have great soil to, to, to do a, a great garden. Um, as I mentioned, um, sandy clay in my backyard, it is on, my yard is on a ridge, and so therefore the water table's deeper in the backyard, so it holds water longer uh, back there. So, um, and I, I'm, you know, as I mentioned, I'm going to go out and I'm going to turn that soil as deep as I can. My dad, he would actually hire a um, a man who had a mule and a plow to come and 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 turn his. Uh, that's how important it is to to get a good deep um, loose um, root base. Okay, so um, let's pick some um, easy plants to grow. <laughs> I like to grow little cherry tomatoes because they're easy. I, I'll 
you know, grow a, a, another variety and it'll be a big giant tomato and I'll go out and some kind of root rot or some kind of bug or something has, has destroyed my tomato. <laughs> These little tomatoes, they produce a lot. Um, easy to grow. Okra, it's easy to grow. Squash is easy to grow. Beans are easy to grow. Um, so, and you don't have to have great soil to do it, but you do have to have great light. You do have to have good drainage, okay? Just a word about companion plants. The only companion plant I use, and I've never seen it listed, um, but I plant um, iris in my, my garden. So iris is a, is a long leaf plant. It's a very common plant and it produces a beautiful bloom in the early spring and April. And um, aphids love them, <laughs> but the aphids don't seem to damage the leaves. So instead of the aphids on my tomato, they're eating their favorite plant, the iris, and I can easily control them. I'll put, you know, two hands on each side of that, of that long leaf and I'll, you know, grasp it and, and raise it forward and I'm just squashing little, little aphids left and right. Um, also, you can wash um, bugs off with a garden hose. You, you know, there's, there's other ways to do it other than, than using um, a pesticide. And, you know, you can get into a miticide, you can get into, uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> you can get into all sorts of chemicals that you really don't want around your house. Um, so have a high tolerance for bugs in your garden. They're gonna come and go in a sense, okay? Um, fungus, was, what was it? Fungicide. So, a miticide, fungicide, and a pesticide. Do you really want all those chemicals around? Do you really want to spray that on your food? Um, you know, if your roses have black spot, maybe it's not the end of the world. Um, my roses have black spot. They did their thing early on. I'm, I'm happy with them. I go out, I prune the dead, the, the diseased part out. I take it, I throw it away. I kind of try to control it that way. Um, I try to control diseases by not watering over the top. I want to water the roots. I don't want to put extra moisture onto the leaves that may help a, a pathogen grow. So think about companion plants in the garden. Uh, onions and garlic are supposed to do some things for you. Marigolds, um, they attract mites and keep, um, mites are, are white flies, I'm not sure. Uh, but they, they keep them away from your, from your, um, from your crop. Let's talk for a minute about flowers, everybody's favorite. You gotta have a great site. You, you know, you gotta have great sun for most flowers. As I mentioned, <clears throat> you gotta have dr great drainage for flowers. So that's gonna get you into the amendment business. So I, I spoke a little bit about pansies, how uh, I want a large particle size in my soil for pansies so I have that great drainage. Well, then when I come in April and I want to put um, green leaf begonias in my flower bed, I need a little heavier soil. So I need smaller particle size. So my amendment for that, I, I like to use composted material. Um, so I'll go to the store and I'll get composted manure. Um, and I, I, I'll pay up for my amendments. Um, there, there's a lot of wide range of amendments out there, but um, I find that the more expensive ones really are, are doing more for you. Um, so with flowers, great drainage, um, but you know, it's a delicate balance. Um, you can't have plant material draining too well in the summertime because you'll be out there watering continuously and mulching continuously. Um, let's see, perennials. Um, my primary choice at home are perennials. You know, the joke is you, friends don't let friends plant annuals. Um, so annuals, I love them. Um, I, I use green leaf begonias at my house this year. Um, University Boulevard, the greens, fabulous annual beds. Um, you know, that is, um, you know, designed to, 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 to wow, right? It's a beautiful presentation and it, it change the face of UAB in a big way. Um, but I like a happy balance of perennials. I, I use cone flowers. I, I tend to use easy things. When I say easy things, I mean things that work. <laughs> uh, things that don't require uh, a whole lot of extra effort. 
uh, coneflowers, rebecca, uh, daylilies, dianthus. Um, I love gray foliage in my flower beds. I love um, lamb's ear, for example. I love Dusty Miller. Um, I love whites in general in the landscape. Um, whites make the greeners green. Um, white makes the bluers blue in my flower bed. Um, so um, think about your, your flower beds, pull on your resources, as I mentioned. Um, the extension services have got some great information out there. Um, I, I use the big box stores. I have a neighborhood garden shop that I use. Uh, and I have what, what I like to call a country, <laughs> a country uh, uh, garden shop, uh, one outside of Jefferson County. Um, so I like to spread myself around. That way you meet a lot of different people. You get a lot of different perspectives. You see a lot of different plant material come through. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm choosy about about the plants that I'm going to that I'm going to bring home. I want to be successful at the end of the day, and I don't want to bring a liability home. Let's talk a little bit about lawns, um, and then I'll shut up, and, and, and hopefully you guys will have some questions for us. Um, as I mentioned, uh, lawns are a big commitment. Um, if you want that infield of Yankee Stadium, <laughs> if, you, if you want Wilmington, um, it's a big commitment. Um, beautiful, I, like I said, I, I love a beautiful lawn but I don't, I don't like a whole lot of lawn. And so what you need to produce a good lawn is, is drainage and some common sense. Um, and what do I mean by common sense? Well, um, you don't wanna reduce the height of your lawn by greater than a third at any one cutting. Um, so that would bring a big stress to the lawn in the growing season. Now, if it were dormant, and you wanted to reduce the height of the lawn, that, that's a different story. You can cut it as low as you wish. And there's, you know, ideal growing heights for all different kinds of grasses and some of them are low as a, you know, an inch. Um, Bermuda can be cut super low on um, make a putting green, for example. Um, but I would encourage you to cut them on the high side and only cut one third off, one third or less at any one mowing. Um, that way you're controlling the weed heads, the weed seeds that are out there. You're holding moisture for that lawn by giving shade um, to the root mass below. Um, if you're going to get into the high maintenance end of things, get your soil test. Um, if you're going to do your own fertilization and, and I want you to call a pro, okay, let's, let's use a professional. Those products that are available to you and me at the store, um, they're good products. Uh, they're not the best products. Um, mostly they're formulated as weed and feed. So as I mentioned, I want to put my pre-emergence out in October. I want to put them out in February and I want to put them out four to six weeks later after February. So that's got me into March. So three applications of pre-emergence, what I want to do if I want to get a high quality lawn. Well, I don't want to put a weed and feed in October because I don't want to feed the lawn in October. I don't want to feed it in, in, in February when there's still a chance of frost well, well into tax day, okay? So <clears throat> no a pro, if, if, you, if, if that's what you want, that's what you need to do. You can manage a, a nice lawn without them. Um, if you're willing to make some, you know, uh, exceptions to, to the quality that, you, that you're really looking for. Um, it's, you know, mowing the lawn is a great time to think. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you that. Um, but it, it can be uh, burdensome. Uh, I think that's all I have um, for you. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed um, this presentation. I'm very grateful to the National Alumni Society Jennifer Breland and Greg Berry and um, my technical advisor, Scott Moran, who helped me out at the last minute and with um, the technical problems at the house. Um, it's been fun. If you guys have any questions, I, I guess we have time for some questions. We sure can. We sure can. And I'll just go down the list. Um, we have alumni, Tim, obviously all over the country. And one question was, what about plants and tree ideas in the DC metro area? Are there ones that you know 
that translate well from here to there? Well, you know, based on my limited visits um, in that part of the country, um, you know, I've seen lots of um, oak hardwood forest there. Um, so um, I think for the most part, um, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to make a recommendation specifically about the DC area um, without, you know, intimate knowledge of that. But um, I guess that's where I'm at, Greg. I, I, I um, sure. hesitate to go out there, but like I said, my, just my limited visits there up the Appalachian Mountains and all into Virginia, um, you know, I'm seeing lots of the same plant material um, from a tree perspective, lots of oaks. What is the best time to prune rose bushes? Yeah, I, I like to prune them in February and there's all different kinds of rose bushes out there. So this morning I was visiting a client and uh, the whole front yard was full of rose, rose bushes. And these are hybrid tea roses, which are the most <laughs> finicky complex roses to, to manage. The whole front yard w was full. So um, I wanna prune those in February, a rambling rose. I'm gonna prune it like a vine. I'm gonna keep the main trunks intact and I'm only gonna prune, I'm sorry, a grapevine. I'm only gonna prune the lateral branches that come off of that main branch on these rambling climbing roses. Um, these um, little roses that are out there now that are so popular, the um, knockout roses, they don't require a whole lot of pruning. Um, you can prune them to shape, but you're not gonna prune, like with a hybrid rose, you're gonna, you're gonna prune 18 inches. You're gonna leave canes maybe 18 inches, two or three canes 18 inches high. But with, with these other more bush-like roses, um, you're only going to do a, a, a delicate pruning of those, and you're going to leave their basic shape. Uh, roses love to be deadheaded, right? So once the rose fades, you come in and you prune it. And with hybrid teas, what, I don't know, what's the what's the formula? I think you go down to the second branch that has a branch with five leaves, and that's where you make your cut. Um, with these knockout roses, I'll go through with my shears I mentioned that I have with the thirty inch handles and I will deadhead them ever so slightly uh, removing that dead part um, and then I try to pick that up because I, I want to have good sanitation in the, in the garden is very important if I left that material down there a pathogen could get in it and just keep repeating the cycle so I'm going to try to be very neat in the garden and um, you know, pick those things up that are susceptible to reinfecting my plant. English ivy seems to possibly choke other plants and they're kind of hard to pull up. What's the best way to get rid of them and should you get rid of them? Well, um, English ivy is, is rather invasive. So I, 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 see it, I see it growing in the forest where it doesn't belong. Um, and, and these are typically in urban areas where, um, well, Red Mountain um, Park is a good example. And I don't know if there's English ivy in Red Mountain Park, but you know, the mining operation was there and clear cutting happened here and there through the park and uh, that allows light to get in and these evasives to, to start to grow. So, um, you know, at one point I managed some uh, English ivy at, at my home. Um, I found it um, somewhat problematic to maintain just because I'm always cut, I was always cutting the edge. Um, so to get rid of it, it's not easy. Um, I would come through with a mower and I would mow it as low as I possibly could about Valentine's Day. <laughs> and when it starts, when green starts to emerge off that plant, whether that's in, in March or April or May, whenever it starts to emerge, that's when I would spray it with the herbicides because I want to try to get it when it's young and vulnerable. Okay. If you wait till into the summer and all, it's going to be very difficult to, to control. Otherwise, it, you know, mechanically, that's how you gotta get rid of it. You gotta, you gotta shovel it out. So February is a great time to do that as well because the soils are nice and moist. Do you prefer to work with clay or red dirt or does it just depend on plants? How does that work? Well, you know, there's, there's dirt and there's soil, right? <laughs> so I would much prefer to work with soil. So, um, you know, let's define soil as, uh, I mentioned the particle sizes in, in soil, sand, silt, clay. Um, so 
that's what Mother Nature's brought you. In my yard, I have a sandy clay. Um, I've been in, in yards, I've been in yards in the Altadena Valley um, that are very, very rocky, but have the most beautiful soil <laughs> on, on top of those rocks, just rich, rich soil. So um, I'm gonna work with what I've, what I've been given, okay? So if, let's say I dig a hole to, to put a oak leaf hydrangea in the ground or a native azalea in the ground, and I dig that hole, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing it at the right time of the year. I'm out there after Valentine's or, excuse me, um, after, after, um, after Halloween, <laughs> Thanksgiving, uh, into Christmas, maybe. I dig my hole and there's a whole lot of clay there. Um, I want to amend that soil because uh, in the case of a native azalea, the root mass is very shallow and very fibrous. Uh, with the oak leaf hydrangea, the root mass is a little tougher. So, you know, you see the oak leaf in nature growing everywhere, growing well. So I, I wouldn't necessarily amend the soil as thoroughly as I would for the native azalea. So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm in red clay, if I'm in orange clay, if I'm in gray clay, I need to change that particle size so that I can get some, some better drainage. But let's talk about, you know, we've dug the hole in the clay uh, don't dig it too deep uh, because the clay is going to hold water. Don't plant any, anything that you're planting, don't plant it too deep out in, in, in the landscape because it needs to be up. My recommendation right now, it needs to be two inches, two and a half inches higher. The root ball needs to be higher. Um, and that's because um, they're coming from the nursery with bark fines. So light material, so that they're successfully growing it in these light materials and they want it light because they're gonna ship it and their shipping costs, they can keep their shipping costs down but the, the lighter their material. So that material is gonna break down over time and your plant's gonna settle. So I, I, want, I want that plant a couple inches higher than the surrounding soil, okay? So I've, I've dug my clay pit. I'm gonna put some small holes in that pit. So maybe with my shovel, I'll, I'll cut, or maybe with the pick, because I want those roots to be able to penetrate that clay. So if you, if you cut that hole <laughs> with your shovel and those walls of that hole are real smooth and clay, it's gonna be hard for those roots to penetrate. So I wanna give them a little break. Also, I'm gonna, I'm gonna amend the soil, like I said, and with, with clays, I'm, I'm gonna want sandy, I'm gonna want larger material. So I dig my hole, I'm gonna put whatever topsoil I have to one side, whatever organic matter I have to one side, I'm gonna be real neat about it. And I'm gonna put my clay to the other side and then I'm gonna to try to use those natural amendments and then I'm gonna add my amendment to it, right? So I'm gonna put that in the hole. Well, what's gonna happen season two <laughs> when that plant gets into the clay? It's gonna hit that clay wall. So um, I've seen some studies, some university studies that say, just go ahead and plant it in the clay. Because that's where it's going to be anyway in a few short years. Uh, I tend to disagree. I, I want to go ahead and get it established and give it every chance it can. So I'm going to, you know, the old saying, if you could buy a $5 plant, put it in a $10 hole. So spend a lot of time um, amending your clays. Um, you know, you're going, to, you're going to get the card that you're dealt with what you've got to work with. Um, you know, one part of my yard is, is, is very dry and sandy clay and the other part's pretty moist and sandy clay. Uh, where the construction happened, my, my, I'm in a neighborhood that's uh, what, 50, 60 years old. Um, if I'm in a, a new subdivision where the bulldozers have come through in the last five, 10 years, you know, that's changed the, that's changed the um, soil around, around these homes. So, you know, these are the cards you dealt with. You're gonna have to amend them in, uh, in order to, um, Get that plant established. You want to think about, hey, what kind of root mass is this? If it's fibrous and and tender, we, we want to we want to give it every chance we can. If it's if it's a if it's a uh, native plant like a native azalea, chances are it's going to be okay planted in that natural soil with only only the the natural amendments that were there, the topsoil and, and organic matter. 
We've got a, a bunch of great questions that have come in and to be respectful of Tim's time, we'll ask him a couple more and then we'll get with Tim and get some more answers and we'll email that out to um, the individuals and the group who, who asked them so you can all take a look at those. Um, what's the best natural pest control for a garden? Um, you know, I, I think the best answer to, the, to that is the plant selections. Um, you know, I don't want to bring anything home that's going to be a, a factory for aphids and white flies. <laughs> um, so plant selection, plant selection, plant selection. So that's why Dr. Talaming wants you to use a native. And um, I mentioned uh, Jan Midgley's book. It's got some great list of native materials out there. Um, those natives are um, not as susceptible to to insects and, and, and so forth. So I, I think prevention is your best bet, right? You know, that's you know, the return 16 to 16 to one is, <laughs> that's the story. Um, an ounce of preventions of, um, or the pound of cure. So um, I, I think that's your best bet with pest control. Also great sanitation. Um, I mentioned the example of the of the black spot on the azaleas, and and as I pruned, I'm going to remove those leaves and and go ahead and put them um, off the property so they'll be carried away. Um, so I think plant selection, sanitation, water. Um, if you can avoid overhead watering, that's great. If you can um, water in the morning, that's best because it reduces the time that the water is on the plant that would help a pathogen along. Um, I guess that's my, my best three um, answers to, to, to pest control. Speaking of water, you mentioned that. When is the best time to water? Morning? Evening? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down with the best time to water is when it's convenient for you because water is such an essential element into, in, for success, right? Um, but if, if I had my time, if I had my, my choice, I would rather water in the morning, um, so in the daylight morning, right? So uh, six to eight to nine, I, I want to get my water out um, so that anything that I may have gotten on a leaf of the plant we have a chance to evaporate. Um, you know, you have to water when it's convenient for you at the end of the day. So, you know, if one o'clock in the mornings when your irrigation system's gonna run because that's when you need it to run, um, that's when you're gonna get your water. It's, it's, you know, you gotta take it. Um, it's that important. But if, if, I, if I could choose, I would do it early in the morning. Awesome. Tim? terrific insight on planting and the, the entire season. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Well, it's been my pleasure. Um, thank you so much. Thank all of you for, for signing on. You're so welcome. And for those alumni in the audience, we have a couple of webinars coming up that you might be interested in. On July 7th, Dr. Patrick Murphy, the Goodrich Endowed Chair of Innovation and Entrepreneurship in the UAB Klatt School of Business, will join us for entrepreneurship in the prevailing circumstances. And then on August 4th, Brandon Wright, director of the UAB Career Center, will be featured as part of networking and interviewing electronically the do's and don'ts. Both of these webinars are free and both will start at noon. You can register for them at alumni.uab.edu. And don't forget to check out our podcast, UAB Green and Told. The podcast allows us the chance to share stories from members of the UAB community. And you can look at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told for that. New episodes are released every other week. Listen in on Spotify, on iTunes, and Stitcher. And be sure to give us a written review so alumni can better find us. And also, you can find out more about the UAB National Alumni Society by checking us out at alumni.uab.edu. And you can get in touch with us at alumni at uab.edu. And finally, be sure to follow us on social media. We'd love to have you. We can be found at UAB Alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On LinkedIn, you can find our group 102797, or better yet, just search UAB Alumni career community. Once again, thank you all for joining us for tonight's virtual event. We will be posting a recording of tonight on our website tomorrow. Good night, and we hope to see you soon. And as always, go Blazers.